Welcome to our program, to our evening together. I am delighted to see so many people. Hi, everybody. Happy Purim week to everyone. Um, and thank you for joining us for our first in our short series of Purim words and music that we are celebrating together this week. Um, I am Rabbi Sarah Berman. I'm the Director of Adult Education here at Central Synagogue, and it is an honor and a pleasure to be joining you this evening for our uh, Persian Words and Music celebration of Purim. Um, Purim is a holiday about our identities, about who we are and the choices that we make, um, what we reveal to people and what we conceal from other people, but also what we reveal and what we conceal from ourselves. And I think that our program tonight is going to uh, dive into some of those questions in really deep, meaningful, and different ways. Before I introduce our speaker, before we are introduced to our speaker, uh, Dahlia Sofer, um, I would like to uh, introduce a member of our board of trustees here at Central Synagogue who will introduce our speaker, Joe Sofer. Thank you, Rabbi. It's uh, with great pleasure to introduce my little sister, Dahlia Sofer. She might be the little one in the family, but she's a giant to us in her achievements. As far back as I remember, Dahlia was a perfectionist. Her sensitive soul absorbed everything around her. Her free spirit soared in her imagination and her deeds. During the Iranian Revolution, our family was split for a long time. After many years of upheaval and separation, when our family was once more united here, Dahlia was only 11 years old. She attended Lycée Francais School in New York and later studied French literature at NYU with a minor in creative writing. She received an MFA from Sarah Lawrence College. Dahlia is the author of the novels Man of My Time by Farrar, Strauss, and Giro, a New York Times editor's choice and notable book of 2020, and The Septembers of Shiraz by Echo Press, 2007, also selected as a New York Times notable book of the year and a finalist for the Jewish Book Award. Her novels have been translated and published in 16 countries. A recipient of a Whiting Award, the Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize, the Sammy Rohr Choice Award, the Siren Land Fellowship, the Santa Maddalena Foundation Fellowship, and multiple residences at Yado, Dahlia has contributed essays and reviews to various publications, including the New York Times Book Review, the LA Review of Books, and The Believer. Currently, she teaches in the MFA program at City University of New York, City College. Although Dahlia's stories incorporate Jewish characters, the themes are more directed to the meets and bounds of human relationships when they are stretched in all directions as victims of persecution. As such, her stories are timeless and readers from all cultural and historical backgrounds can relate to her writings. Without further ado, I present Dahlia Sofer. Joe, thank you so much for this really beautiful introduction. And it's so special for me to be here with you. And Rabbi Berman, thank you also for inviting me. I just want to say this synagogue and this congregation I know has been such a, has held such a special place in Joe's life and also in our lives as a family. And you've been there for us through all kinds of situations, joyful and situations of grief. So it's really very special for me to be here. And I thank you. Well, Dahlia, that introduction that Joe just gave, it was beautiful. And Joe, thank you so much for doing this um, and for helping make this happen. Um, but Dahlia, what is it important for us to know about you, about your, your upbringing, um, and especially those years until age 11 when you were all able to come together as a family again? Well, um, I was born in Tehran. Um, I, uh, my father was originally from uh, Baghdad. He emigrated in the 40s during the Farhud to Iran. And my mother, born in Iran, but also uh, of Iraqi origin, her family emigrated um, in the early 20th century. So we have a mixed heritage. Um, until the revolution, we lived 
a comfortable life, um, you know, of family, vacations, and so on. And of course, like everybody else, our lives were um, disrupted very much during the revolution. Uh, my brothers left at that time, and my sister, myself, and my parents stayed for many years after the revolution until we left eventually in the early 80s. Uh, and we left and arrived in the US um, after a brief stay in, uh, in Israel. So you have all of these different homes. Um, what was the experience like? How are the experiences different growing up in Iran versus the time in Israel versus finally coming to the US? You know, what, what was in common between these places, but also what was unique in each of these places? I mean, um, the concept of home is so uh, complicated. Um, it's partly geographic, but it has so much to do with family um, and uh, where the heart resides and also language, of course. So um, one of the great joys was to be reunited, obviously, after the revolution. Um, but it was also, you know, a period of disorientation and displacement. Um, I remember the first thing that I noticed when coming to the US was size, you know, everything was just big, uh, from buildings to cars to packs of gum. And, you know, initially this amused me, but eventually I understood this is actually a philosophy, you know, it's a sort of this idea of, of um, wanting to occupy space, you know, which is um, maybe troubled me at, you know, somewhat at the time and maybe continues to trouble me. So uh, that was one thing. Another thing was getting used to the individualism that's at the core of American culture. And it's very different um, in Middle Eastern culture, Iranian culture as well. Uh, it's much more communal. It's more geared toward the other. Uh, so, you know, people wouldn't sort of make appointments with each other a month ahead to meet for coffee. <laughs> they would uh, stop by if they're in the neighborhood. Um, I'll share brief story uh, from when we first came uh, we were staying this is the first couple of months we were staying with my brother uh, Joe who had come years before us and uh, an encyclopedia salesman stopped by and uh, my mother invited him in because he's a guest and she asked him if he's hungry he said he was she cooked him fish and and rice and we were on our way to dinner somewhere and we sat with him for a couple of hours uh as he ate and needless to say we were very late uh, but for our dinner but it was this idea of well you we don't turn a guest away and it took us a while to get used to uh, a different way of being in the world and finally language you know i i had been in a french school in iran until the revolution uh and here again, we were enrolled, my sister and I were enrolled in a French school. So I was sort of three times removed from the dominant culture uh, and language, you know, it's sort of an Iranian in a um, French school in America. So there was a lot of confusion and displacement and it took a while to orient myself. Well, language is something that is, um... Uh, it, it's used, you, you almost weave with language in the books that you've written. Um, there's something shining and shimmering and so complex about, about language um, in, in your books. So I wanna take us towards your books. Um, you also mentioned family as being a part of your, um, your experience of moving around and finding home and the, the mutability of home. Um, can you tell us what, what September's of Shiraz, your first book, um, what, what that's about? Uh, sure. September's of Shiraz, um, it's basically the story of a man who is wrongly imprisoned in Iran in the immediate aftermath of the revolution. Um, and the book traces his, his unraveling, um, the unraveling of his life and the lives of his family and also of his sense of self or, or how he has come to understand himself up, up until that point. 
um, yeah. So I think you have an excerpt um, for, for anyone who has not read the entirety of this book. Um, I, if you, again, so folks can see it, this is, this is the book. Um, and you have an excerpt to read to us. I do. Um, so this is from the very beginning of the book, um, a few uh, paragraphs from the beginning. When Isaac Amin sees two men with rifles walk into his office at half past noon on a warm autumn day in Tehran, his first thought is that he won't be able to join his wife and daughter for lunch as promised. Brother Amin, the shorter of the men says, Isaac nods. A few months ago, they took his friend Kurosh Nasiri and just weeks later, news got around that Ali the Baker had disappeared. We're here by orders of the Revolutionary Guards. The smaller man points his rifle directly at Isaac and walks toward him, his steps too long for his legs. You are under arrest, brother. Isaac shuts the inventory notebook before him. He looks down at his desk at the indifferent items witnessing this event, the scattered files, a metal paperweight, a box of Dunhill cigarettes, a crystal ashtray, and a cup of tea, freshly brewed, two mint leaves floating inside. His calendar is spread open and he stares at it, at today's date, September 20, 1981, at the note scribbled on the page, call Mr. Nakamura regarding pearls, lunch at home, receive shipment of black opals from Australia around 3 p.m., pick up shoes from cobbler, appointments he won't be keeping. On the opposite page is a glossy photo of the Hafez mausoleum in Shiraz. Under it are the words, City of Poets and Roses. May I see your papers, Isaac asks. Papers, the man chuckles. Brother, don't concern yourself with papers. The other man, silent until now, takes a few steps. You are Brother Amin, correct, he asks. Yes, then please follow us. And I'll just um, jump ahead to a passage where he is already at the detention center. Isaac rests his head against the wall. How odd that he should get arrested today of all days when he was going to make up his long absences to his wife and daughter by joining them for lunch. For months, he had been leaving the house at dawn when the snow-covered Alborz mountains slowly unveiled themselves in the red-orange light and the city shook itself out of sleep, lights in bedrooms and kitchens coming on one after the other, languidly at first, then gaining momentum. And he had been returning from the office long after the supper dishes had been washed and stored away and Shirin had gone to bed. At night, walking up the stairs of his two-story villa, he could already hear the television buzzing. And in the living room, he would find Farnaz in her silk nightgown, cognac in hand, soaking up the chaos of the evening news. The cognac, she said, its stinging vapors, its roundness and warmth made the news more palatable. And Isaac did not object to this new habit of hers, which he suspected made up for his absences. In the living room, he would stand next to her, his briefcase an extension of his hand, neither sitting beside her nor ignoring her. Standing was all he could manage. They would say little to each other, a few words about the day or Shirin or some explosion somewhere, and he would retire to the bedroom exhausted, trying to sleep but unable, the television's drone seeping into the dark darkness. Lying awake in bed, he would often think that if she would only shut off the news and come to him, he would remember how to talk to her. But the television, with its images of rioting crowds and burning movie theaters, with its wretched footage of his country coming undone street by street, had taken his place long before he had learned to find refuge in his work, long even before the cognac had become necessary. And I'll stop there. This passage, even just this short passage, introduces some of the elements that I think really mark your writing. Um, these are stories of family and they're about identity. And they're also about place, very specific places. Um, can you talk to us about how you build each of those pieces and how you build your stories in your books? Well, in this book, um, specifically, I think for a long time I had felt that I've, I had been living with an absence. Mm -hmm. And so eventually I 
sort of wrote my way, wrote my way around the absence and eventually into it, I, I felt like I needed to fill it. And so I, I worked with my own very fragmented memory of pre-revolutionary Iran and also the time during rev the revolution and after, but also the recollections of others, uh, my parents, my father specifically, who had spent some time in prison, uh, my siblings as well, um, and others. Uh, I read uh, accounts of other prisoners. I looked at a lot of photographs um, mm -hmm. that sort of jotted my memory or informed me. Um, and obviously read a lot of books. So it was really this sort of this um, uh, endeavor or uh, adventure almost of reconstruction um, of something that I felt had been lost. Um, yeah. It's, it's almost like looking through a window for us as readers. Um, but it sounds a little bit like that for you as a writer too. You're, you're choosing which which pains to look in through and and how to put each of those pieces together. Is that kind of accurate? Yeah, that is very much, that is accurate. I mean, that, that goes, I, I suppose, into the writing of any book is that you have to select, you know, what you're going to focus on and how those pieces are going to connect, you know, this book is told from four points of view. So it's Isaac predominantly, but also points of view of his wife, his daughter, and his son who is living in New York. Um, and so it's sort of finding ways to connect those pieces and uh, try to come up with some kind of cohesive whole at the end. Well, what this book does in particular is it captures the unraveling or the undoing of you know, in parallel, it's of a person and of a family and of an entire country. Um, which piece of this story came to you first? Or did you build all of it all at once? I think first and foremost, it was Isaac. Um, for me, he really was the, the nucleus of this book. And I had the first sentence long before I had anything else, uh, maybe years before. Um, and I wasn't sure how I'm going to tell this story. Uh, and the more I wrote it and wrote into it, it expanded. So it became uh, less and less about uh, exactly what happened to me and my family and more and more, it sort of spread open. And so I was interested in not only telling the story of this family, but also incorporating incorporating it within this larger story of an entire society that's um, undergoing these um, convulsions, if you like. Um, how how we understand ourselves or how we perceive ourselves, it's not always in harmony with how other people see us or want to define us. Um, and I think of that in terms of the Purim story, in terms of how Jews were understood by Haman or even by the king Ahasuerus. Um, but this is true I mean, of Jews in all times, in all places, um, but it's also true of just humans, period. Um, you made your characters Jewish. Um, that is, that's a part of his identity here. Um, how do you think that the perception of who he is versus who he understands himself to be um, match up or are in, in discord? And, yeah. and what does his Jewishness have to do with that? Mm -hmm. Well, um, Isaac is a secular man, largely, and he has lived a sort of secular life. Uh, and he's somebody who considers himself rather integrated in society, and he was up until that point. Um, and suddenly he's imprisoned in part, not entirely, but in part because he's Jewish. Uh, and he's accused of being a Zionist spy, which is completely absurd in the context of his life, but there he is. 
Um, so sort of regardless of how he perceived himself or how he lived or the beliefs he had, he was defined as something else. Um, and likewise, you know, I have a sort of parallel story in the book with the son who is in New York and he's taken in by a Hasidic family, not taken in, but welcomed. Um, but there is uh, a limit also to their kindness because at the end of the day, they realize he's not one of them. And so they reject him in some ways. Um, so there are all these ways that, um, you know, religion can bring people together or it can divide them or it can make people um, uh, define someone as something that they don't consider themselves to be. Um, but more essentially, I was interested in Jewishness um, as almost something inherited, you know, as something that one carries in one's body and one's psyche, um, you know, to sort of paraphrase one of my favorite writers who's um, a Yugoslav writer by the name of Danilo Kish. He wrote something along the lines of um, um, to be Jewish is to be reminded that one is such. And so there is this idea of no matter what you do, that you are reminded by others uh, outside or by others in the community and by yourself and your memory and your own sort of uh, genetic makeup or whatever it is. So it's something that one carries. And uh, I was exploring that in the book. Is that something that you have felt also for yourself and in your own life? carrying your Jewishness. Um, and I'm in particular interested in your experience of being Jewish in Tehran and in New York, um, places that are not Israel, places mm -hmm. where you don't just walk down the street and assume that about a person that you see. Yeah, I mean, I think up until the revolution, um, I didn't really, I think, well, I was very young, so I also didn't really think about the differences very much. Uh, or, and it wasn't that apparent to me, just in the context of the life we were living. You know, Jew, Jews were quite integrated in Iranian society um, uh, up until the revolution. And as a child, I think I was sort of not aware of that identity as much, although we celebrated the holidays and all of that. So there was always this sort of private thing that we did at home that, you know, wasn't happening outside, but it didn't seem to be a problem, really. It just was. Um, and afterward, it was a little bit more of a problem, uh, you know, um, not really, I mean, Jews were sort of officially recognized and so on by the revolutionary government. Um, but I did begin to feel that there is a sort of um, schism happening. Mm -hmm. um, and then coming to the United States, um, I think there is something else that happens because maybe the majority of Jews are of Ashkenazi origin. So again, one feels a little bit less, um, you know, part of the whole, or I did at the very least. Um, so it's always something that 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 needs exploration, I think. Um, and you know, I'm I am somebody who has lived a secular life, but at the same time. I am very interested in Jewish memory and this idea of, of um, just carrying it, you know, in oneself and through writing, if possible. Carrying our memories, feeling our memories, wearing our memories. Um, I think that is a through line in in both of these books. Um, so I'm. I'm not surprised to hear that about how you think about Jewishness, because it really does come through in, in your writing, this sense that we are the sum total of our stories. Um, so let's look at your more recent book from 2020, Man of My Time. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this book, which does not have a, a Jewish protagonist? Right. Um, it's even hard to call him a protagonist, almost. <laughs> right. <laughs> tell, yeah. tell us about this man. 
Uh, well, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's man of my time. It's the story of a man named Hamid Mozaffarian, and he is he's a man who sort of um, grows up as a somewhat solitary boy. He's alienated from his family, um, his father especially. And he grows up to be a revolutionary. Um, and after a series of wrong turns, including um, an act of really irreversible betrayal against his father, he breaks with the family. Um, the family leaves for America, he chooses to stay, and he gets more and more involved in the new government, um, sort of despite himself. So at first he becomes a state interrogator. And decades later, when he can no longer justify this to himself. He uh, exits that life and he um, uh, becomes a functionary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So when we meet him, he's in New York on a diplomatic mission and he has been contacted by his estranged family and asked to carry his father's ashes back to Tehran. And the story begins there, um, but doesn't end there. It's, it's, um, you know, I am, of, I'm particularly interested in, in your writing and your stories, um, partially because with my background in ancient and Islamic art, I think maybe the best way I can describe your writing, and I don't know that I've said this to you before, Dahlia, um, it reminds me of Persian miniature painting, it, that every piece of it is a perfect self-contained moment that it all builds to something larger and beautiful and um, and spilling out into the world. I mean, these are paintings that transgressed their borders, um, but every single piece of it is is a solid, solitary, singular, fully formed piece. Um, that really is is the best way that I can describe um, your writing style. And I'd love for you to share some of your your writing, some of the this book with um, with our our community here. Um, so this is an excerpt from Man of My Time, and not all covers look like this. This is just the cover that I have. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you for that. Um, that that was beautiful, and that means a lot to me because. Um, it's just a beautiful analogy. Thank you. Um, so I'll read a little bit. This is from the middle of the book when Hamid is remembering uh, the day his family departed and he chose to stay. When I left my family at the departure gate at Mehrabad airport in that summer of 79, it was they who called out my name and not the other way around. Hamid, Hamid cried my father amid the footsteps of travelers and the public address system, blaring departures, arrivals, delays, cancellations. I didn't turn back. I allowed my father's broken voice to inoculate me against loyalty, and I kept on walking, one foot in front of the other, facing a splintering city promising solitude. A hot wind filled my father's old pecan as I drove home with the windows rolled down dust and pollution making everything, the abandoned construction sites and the rusted cranes feel like the yellowing sketches of a dead architect. I parked the car on Shahreza Street, renamed Angalab Revolution, and walked toward the apartment. The old frame shop still displayed in its window prints of docile kittens, London Bridge, and Alpine Forest. The cassette seller next door played one of the Ayatollah's old speeches. When I opened the door to the empty house, my reflection in the foyer mirror startled me. I looked at my hard, haggard face and asked myself a question that would haunt me for the rest of my days. How does the stone stand being a stone? The hollow glove stacked palms up on the console were as solemn as an undertaker's handshake. In the living room, my mother's red cardigan draped over the sofa. My father's slippers abandoned at the foot of the settee, and my brother's favorite vinyl, Bonnie M's Mabeker single, left behind on the coffee table, all bore the fingerprints of familial heartbreak. On the floor next to my father's slippers was the last book he had read in that settee, a monograph of, on Caravaggio. I picked it up, 
It was bookmarked at a page on the calling of St. Matthew. I stared mesmerized at the photograph of the painting, remembering the old Polaroid I had once found in his desk drawer. It was the grit that now drew me in, the seedy tavern, the weathered faces, the bare dirty feet of St. Peter. I loved the image in, its, in all its soil and unsaintliness. I loved too the outstretched arm beckoning in the ray of light and the stunned face of Matthew pointing at himself. I closed the book, wondering why I had shirked countless times my father's attempts to share with me his love of Caravaggio. I wanted to call Minu, but felt unqualified for both sympathy and love. Instead, I went to the kitchen where an unwashed teacup sang a requiem from the sink, and I made myself two sunny side up eggs, the heady smell of frying butter convincing me that I had done the right thing. At my father's seat near the window, I ate ravenously. His morning paper was still on the breakfast table. I did not read it. Thank you. The, the words are, you know, connected. Your your style as a writer is still, you know, precise and perfect. But your storytelling is very different in in this second book. Um, how did your approach to storytelling and writing change between the books, or change specifically for this story that you were telling? Yeah, I mean, as I said, in the first book, I kind of um, was interested in filling this absence with um, sort of making some kind of uh, narrative out of this whole mess of memory. And after I had written that book, I mean, I felt a certain sense of um, completion, perhaps, and maybe um, not relief, really, but some kind of gratification that something had come together. But that didn't last very long. Soon afterward, I felt like it was all sort of falling apart again. And um, so this book was really born out of a completely opposite impulse, which was to undo the narrative and to sort of, uh, because I felt like, okay, for every narrative, there's um, a counter narrative and for every context, there is an equally valid, you know, parallel context. And so this book is, is even though it's told from the point of view, a first person point of view, um, it's filled with discordant um, voices and opinions and experiences. And um, it's a book of multitudes, you know, it's sort of, I think of it as sort of polyphonic in that way. Um, so if the first book was sort of um, born out of an impulse to reconstruct, this one was born out of an impulse to deconstruct. Um, a couple of other things that were really important. One was the inclusion of multiple generations, because I felt like um, the, the actions of each individual really have ripple effects on the lives of everybody around them, but also the lives of everybody that's going to be born in, you know, subsequent generations. So, um, and also everybody else's actions has uh, an effect on that individual's life. So there's this symbiosis that's happening that I wanted to tap into. And lastly, I was interested in the treatment of time. So um, it's a novel that looks back at the past, but it doesn't reside in the past. It's not interested in memorializing the past. It's sort of looking into the past in order to inform the present and uh, perhaps also um, inform the future, you know, so it's it doesn't reside in the past. Which is so interesting because instead of multiple voices, this novel takes place in multiple times, but all of it building to the present or as you say, to the future with a question mark. Yeah. Um, both of these books navigate a world between Iran and the US. Um, I mean, both of them are, are um, in, in both of these places and you draw place so finely, um, but it's not just place, it's about a person's relationship to that place and their relationship to the nation or to nationalism. Um, what is it that that you observe about Americans and Iranians 
in terms of our relationships with nation and nationalism? I mean, I think both um, both people, as 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 most as all people probably have these sort of national narratives. So um, Iran has a narrative of greatness, you know, of um, having been of ha of being an ancient civilization, of having once been an empire. So there is this sort of um, uh, assumption or attitude of might and and uh, um, of wanting to have influence, you know, in, in the world. Um, uh, and of course, you know, it, it has also, and, and it, it's not just the empire that also now has the um, uh, the Islamic regime, you know, uh, so that plays a part too in, in wanting to seek influence. Uh, and America has uh, also a narrative of greatness, um, one of exceptionalism and also one of sort of seeing itself as a beacon of light you know in the world and so all of these narratives have some truth to them but also they're simplified as as uh, most of these things are that the truth is often more complicated always true i mean always <laughs> always true um before i ask my next question i want to make sure that our friends here in our zoom room and our friends on facebook know that uh, we will uh, come to a Q&A moment before too long. So if you have questions for Dahlia, this is a great time to start considering that and putting those into our chat boxes. Um, and I will be looking, um, looking into those chat boxes in just a few moments. Um, this main character, Hamid, is an interrogator. He is affiliated with the government and his job is to dig out the, uh, the secrets of those who sit before him. Um, it, sometimes those secrets are true and sometimes uh, it's not clear if they are or if it's just the most expedient way to get out of a bad situation. Um, but he's also a self interrogator he does question himself and his motives and his uh, and his meaning in life. Can you talk a little bit about that relationship between interrogation of others and interrogation of self? Um, and just along with that, when we uh, when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, we also talked about this as another Jewish trait, even though this character is not himself Jewish. Um, so can we talk about interrogation of self and of others yeah i think i think for a long time i've been interested in this concept of interrogation and also of confession um you know in interrogation in, in certain ways can be a way to uh, gain knowledge so interrogation in terms of interrogating history the past uh, oneself others um, uh, it's a form, yeah, to seek knowledge. Confession also can be a way to um, perhaps share a certain truth with others. Um, of course, there's also the religious connotation in Catholicism, which is it's a way toward salvation. Um, but both of these things can be uh, coerced, of course, and especially in political context. So um, interrogation can be uh, can become a tool to um sort of uh make somebody implicate themselves or or say something that's not true um same with a confession so hamid his job is an interrogator but i wasn't really interested in the sort of mechanics of interrogation uh so there are very few if any uh interrogation scenes in the book there is one non-interrogation scene where <laughs> hamid says if I were to write about it, I would say this or that. So he kind of tells the reader what it's about, but he doesn't really get into it. Right. Um, and there are two others where mostly he's bored um, because he's repeating the same questions. You know, he feels like a customs officer. Um, so uh, his real 
interrogation is, as you said, his self-interrogation. And that's really where he's probing. He's trying to understand you know, himself and his past and his relation to uh, his, his, um, his country and his actions and so on. Um, so, you know, and I've, I've often sort of thought of this book as, a, as itself a kind of um, pilgrimage, you know, from ignorance to self-knowledge. This is sort of Hamid's pilgrimage um, uh, to gain at least, you know, if he doesn't entirely change, he at least gains knowledge of himself. Um, it's so interesting that you say, even if he doesn't change, um, I, uh, I cracked the spine of my book in three different places where I felt like he was changing, um, but, uh, but I'm not so sure. Now I'm not so sure. Um, but that idea of, of interrogating self and of um, using one's history, not as something to rest upon, but to agitate, um, that, feels like how we use our, our Jewish year. Every holiday points us towards the past, but propels us towards the future. Um, and so even though, again, this character isn't Jewish, he knows what a minion is, but he isn't Jewish. Um, he, uh, there's a real, a, a very Jewish sense about him in his sense of displacement, both in, um, in his in his own life, and in uh, a sense of meaning um, in his own time. So that sense of displacement, I mean, you yourself come from parents um, or, or generations that came from another place, um, came to a new place, had to leave that place at a young age. You, you went and lived in Israel for a time and then ultimately ended up here in the United States. That's a lot of dislocation for, you know, one, for two, three generations, let alone, you know, one and a half generations. Is this sense of displacement um, something that, well, no, how does this sense of displacement, um, how is it that you, you wrestle with it? How do you handle it um, in, a, you know, in, in through your writing or through your life? Oh, um, to go back to your question of um, interrogation, I think you're right that it is, you know, it is at the core of Jewish thought. Um, and I think that, yes, you know, this character is not Jewish, um, but I must have brought that sensibility into it, you know, sort of unconsciously. Um, and the same with displacement. I think it's something that I live with so closely and so all of my characters um, in both books probably are in some form of exile. So in Man of My Time, uh, the family is in geographic exile, they've left. And they're also in, in a kind of emotional exile because they are having trouble um, sort of finding their, their um, place in, in America, uh, both the parents and Hamid's brother. Um, Hamid himself is not in geographic exile, but he's in a kind of spiritual exile. And so, um, and I think that's probably something that I just naturally bring to my characters because it's something that I live with. I think, you know, one of my earliest memories of displacement is being three or four years old and walking into my kindergarten and everybody was speaking French. <laughs> I had no idea that it's a different language. Like I just thought I suddenly don't understand what's being said. Um, I didn't quite grasp that, oh, I'm in a different, you know, this is French school. Um, and I, I remember just feeling suddenly like, oh my God, I, I must be stupid. I can't understand anything. Um, and, you know, that has been repeated time and time again of being in situations where, of course, I now have the <laughs> understanding that I'm in a new and strange situation. But um, it's something that I've sort of repeatedly just um, lived with. And I think, 
you know, I think of my characters as being in exile, um, not necessarily immigrants. Um, and this is because I think immigration has a certain sense of agency that um, being in exile doesn't. And so um, uh, it's a different state of mind, you know, uh, yeah. it's one that has less, that's less in control of the situation. And that's a really important thing, I think, for us to understand, especially those of us who have not experienced that. Um, as we look around our world and are seeing so many who are displaced, not through choice right now, um, that's, that's a really important thing for us to, to hear. Um, one more call for questions into our chat box. I'm seeing folks in our Zoom room who are some of your nearest and dearest. Um, feel free to ask your questions as well. Um, uh, but also uh, a lot of our, our wider community. I'd love to, to know what you want to ask Dahlia. So please put your questions into the chat box. Before, before I, I look for those questions though, um, one of the things that, uh, that you and I talked about from our very first conversation was about uh, art and history and art history. Um, <laughs> That, uh, that art captures so much of history that isn't written down. Um, it's a more uh, uh, diverse view sometimes of, of the past um, more than what written histories can, can tell us. Um, how do you see art, um, which plays a role in, you know, in all of your writing? How do you see art? How do you understand art? Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with you that, um... You know, art can capture human experience in a way that um, historical records really can't. It, it sort of sheds light on what it's like to be a human at a given time in a given place. Um, and so that's something that interests me a great deal. And I know it does interest you too, since that's your background. Um, and, you know, in terms of Iranian art, you know, the Iranian culture and art has such a long history. We always talk about the politics, but there's this whole other uh, um, history of culture um, that exists. And so I wanted to weave the two into the book and sort of reflect um, how one has affected the other and how they have sort of conversed with each other. Um, most, a lot of my characters in this book are artists or, or have an interest in art. The father is, uh, an art historian who's compiling, who was compiling an encyclopedia of Iranian art and he's sort of seeking to tell the narrative of the country through this endeavor. Um, it's an impossible task, but he's sort of this manic sort of, uh, uh, mad, you know, he has a mad method to him that he just really wants to do this. Um, Hamid himself was interested in drawing as a young man. And uh, there's a central figure, um, an art, a satirical artist um, who was persecuted by both the Pahlavi regime and the post-revolutionary government. And that figure was, was inspired by an actual artist named Adeshir Mohassas was a satirical artist um, who um, depicted Iran for many decades, um, both before the revolution and after. So we asked you here tonight um, to, to talk about uh, your writing in the context of Purim, in the context of uh, uh, of a story that takes place in Iran, we asked a storyteller whose stories take place in Iran. Purim could take place anywhere, but that's, that's where our story takes us. Um, and so it has a place in our communal Jewish history, our, our shared Jewish lives, um, and our shared Jewish imaginations. So, but most of us have never been there. So I'm curious, for you, what is the place of Iran in your imagination and in your life today? Um, well, it, it has certainly occupied a large part of my um, writing life, to be sure, and my imagination. And in both of these books, you know, 
the uh, the principal um, action takes place in Tehran, and everything else that occurs is sort of an offshoot of that. So it's really the origin story for me, uh, and it has been for so long. I'm now looking to um, try to <laughs> look less to this sort of origin story and be more present uh with this absence that i was talking about without trying to fill it in or deconstruct it or you know just stay in the presence of the absence if you like um and that's difficult it's difficult for me to not look that way because all my material is there but i'm trying to um do something different this time um we have a question from our zoom room Steve is, uh, sorry, yes, Steve is asking, have you decided on a subject for your next book? Um, well, it has to do a little bit with what I was saying. So not looking um, to by a story that's buttressed by this sort of uh, um, narrative of Iran, although that will always just be part of, you know, what I work on just because it's, it's my experience. But uh, something that makes me really uh, face what I have um, before me, you know, and I feel like I owe it to myself as a human and as a writer to to also discover that other aspect of what it's like to live with something that doesn't feel as rich, you know, as that other mm -hmm. story. Well, no pressure, but uh, the next question in our Zoom room is, uh, when will that next novel come out? <laughs> Another Steve, a second Steve is uh, holding a place on his reading list. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but thank you for that. <laughs> oh, I'll be waiting excitedly for that. Um, yeah, I wanna offer one last chance for folks to, uh, to add their questions if they have them. Um, Dahlia, it's, as I, as I wait for folks to, um, uh, take this last prompt to add more questions. I want to thank you, not just for joining us tonight, though that is truly, truly an honor, um, but I wanted to thank you for sharing these stories, which are your stories and our stories and, um, and, and stories that we all really um, deserve to read. So thank you so much for, for sharing these with with thank all of us, with all of your readers. Thank you so much again for having me, really. It means a lot to me, thank you. Yeah. Um, we do have one question from Facebook, which is about the, the situation for Jews in Iran at, at the present time. Do you have uh, friends or family there who, who tell you about what life is like? Um, and I uh, guess I would expand that to Jews and non-Jews. Yeah, I mean, I hesitate to talk about that because I'm not there. So it's always, you know, secondhand reporting. Um, but um, I have friends who go, not Jews. Uh, one of my friends lives, happens to live across from a synagogue. So he's always mm -hmm. sending me pictures from what's happening in there. Um, so there is a life uh, and it's, it's, it's vibrant and it's active. However, it's not what it once was, you know, I mean, the community was something like 100,000 people before the revolution, and it's now something like 8,000. Yeah. Um, there are no exact figures. So it has diminished and it's, I think there is a life and it's sort of largely left, um, left alone, but, um, it doesn't, I don't think it has the vibrancy that it once had. It's not in danger, but it's there. And, but however, it is the largest, I think, Jewish community still in the Middle East. So that's something, you know. Um, and uh, another question from Facebook. Um, and if I may be so bold, perhaps this question is for both you and for Joe. Um, do you remember the role of Purim? in your in your family and in your Jewish community when you were living in Iran. Um, what was that experience like? Joe, I'll let you take that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it was 
uh, celebrated as, as often or as, as peculiarly as here. Um, we did have the Megillah, and I remember my grandfather would read parts, parts of it. But I think, you know, because it was a story of persecution and we were living you know, there, it would not be a story that would be told. Uh, uh, so in a sense, it was not like you know, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, or Passover. Uh, but it was remembered. Uh, and uh, uh, funny enough, you now there is a, 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 a place that apparently and, and a lot of people, Jews and non-Jews, would visit in Hamidan, which was the tomb of Esther and Mordecai. Uh, and I, I have been there. Uh, it's a little place, but you know, you would go in, and there were two uh, uh, big, you know, uh, uh, tombs there, and there were Jewish inscriptions and everything. And the the legend is that that was where Esther and Mordecai have been have been buried. And I was always fascinated by that. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask just two last questions. Um, Dahlia, have your books been read in Iran? Um, not officially, um, okay. because there is a kind of there's a ban, I suppose, of, of um, you know, exchange uh, of any commercial exchange. And also the, the, the content is not necessarily uh, something that would uh, past the censorship, you know, there. Uh, but I think that unofficially, yeah, I've heard, heard from people um, here and there. So, yeah. And I think the last question for us, um, because it's so deeply tied up in in the stories that you tell, um, and uh, and and in the life that you lead. If you can just say a little bit more about the difference between the immigrant and the exile, um, which one are you? Oh, I think I think I would have to go with exile because I I don't feel that sense of agency, you know. And I maybe it's because I was a child and I didn't make the decision myself. I think that I would have made that decision had I been an adult. But um, it's it's a kind of state of mind, and um, I've you know if the, the the word immigrant comes from the Latin immigrare, and it's it's to move into, and there is something sort of active about it. Whereas again, exile I think is a different state of mind, and I've I've often you know I've mentioned this elsewhere, but I'll do so here again. Um, there is to exile. Um, an element of shame, and um, and the first time that, and again, I've talked about this elsewhere, but the first time that I encountered it was um, in a memoir about uh, Paul Rosenberg, the art dealer in France in, during World War II, and that when he came here, uh, his granddaughter wrote that um, even though he had to leave, he was full of shame, and it was the first time that I saw that in someone else because I'd always felt it and I didn't understand what it was about. Um, uh, and th th there's a historian, Emmanuel Loyer, a French historian, who described it as exile is somewhere between um, flight and treason, uh, even though it's not really, you know, logically it's not. But uh, there is a sense of having a ban having jumped ship um and so i think uh that's something that i i do sort of live with um not being where i should be perhaps well we appreciate you being here with us tonight this is where you should be so <laughs> Thank you once again, Dahlia. Thank you, Joe, for making the connection and for doing a wonderful introduction. Um, and jumping in on a question as well. Um, it has really been um, a great experience to be here and to hear from you and to learn from you this evening. Thank you, Dahlia. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Have a wonderful evening. Chag Purim Sameach. I hope you enjoy the Purim Spiel tomorrow night in the Megillah reading and our next words and music installation. The music comes on Thursday. So I hope we'll see you back here then. 
Have a great night, everybody.